Shall we turn in our Bibles? We're continuing our series in Psalms. Got a few more weeks left there, and we're in Psalm 77 today. And Psalm 77 is a lament psalm. Alright, as, as we read, let's especially listen to the words, remembering that these were, were songs um, meant to be heard and received into the heart. And this one is for the choir director, according to Jedithan, of Asaph, a psalm. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refused to be comforted. I think of God, I groan. I meditate. My spirit becomes weak. You have kept me from closing my eyes. I am troubled and cannot speak. I consider days of old, years long past. At night, I remember my music. I meditate in my heart and my spirit ponders. Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Selah. So I say I am grieved that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions. God, your way is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You revealed your strength among the peoples. With power you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Salah. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you, they trembled. Even the depths shook. The clouds poured down water. The storm clouds thundered. Your arrows flashed back and forth. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth shook and quaked. Your way went through the sea and your path through the great waters. But your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we might behold wonderful things out of your word. And we pray that you would incline our hearts to your testimonies, your truth, and not to selfish gain. Help us to learn everything, Holy Spirit, that you have spoken and even prepared for our hearts as a church and as individuals this morning. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as with many of the Psalms, the writer here is at a point of intense struggle and difficulty. We can see this in verse 4. You have kept me from closing my eyes, he says. I am troubled and I cannot speak. He experiences many of the psychological and physical symptoms that today are associated with depression. He is struggling even to sleep at night. And he is struggling to express his pain to others. Perhaps you know what that feels like. The Psalms serve many purposes, and one of their most important is to remind us that God is present in the hardest times. God has not abandoned you when life and its realities come crashing down on you like a sledgehammer. The Psalms console us that struggle is an authentic part of life, and that it is not something to be avoided at all costs. We cannot run away from the realness of life, and if we try, as many do, we will miss some of God's most profound lessons. Many of those lessons are found in this psalm, which is an incredibly authentic lament. I'm sure you'll agree. Those words were, were genuine. They came from the depths of someone's heart. The psalmist's struggle here is so obviously raw and real, and he does not run from it, but he learns the lesson, and the lesson is he turns to God. He turns to God with his struggles in order to face them and in order for God 
to deal with those circumstances. And here is how he does it through song. He says in verse 1, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. So he positions himself well. He seeks his God. And at this point, we might conclude that he is a wonderful model, a great example for us to follow. He is certain that God will hear his cry for help, and he does not seek God just in a moment or in a passing way, but he seeks him with resolve. Surely this is the ideal response in a day of trouble. But then come some troubling and confusing words. And these words are full of the reality of life. In the second half of verse 2, he says, I refused to be comforted. And this comes with a profound implication, something else that the Psalms and poetry teach us, that we don't need to pretend with God, friends. We should never pretend with God. He knows how hard life can be, and he accepts us. He accepts you at your most vulnerable and even at your most honest. The psalmist refused to be comforted. I'm going to digress a little bit to apply this, hopefully, to our lives and to ask you, when did you last cry aloud to God? When last were you in a situation that caused such anguish that you spent all night in prayer? Those questions are not telling you to go looking for trouble, but they should give us pause and ask certain questions of our lives. Perhaps you are not at this point now. Perhaps you have been sheltered. Some would say blessed to have never encountered such tragedy. But I know many of you know what the psalmist is talking about. Because none of us can escape the realities of life for long. And when they find us, in whatever form they find us, we must be equipped to turn to God and to take those situations to him. And a very, very important consideration, something that I, I hope will land on you this morning, is that I don't think that we should expect these tragedies to be only individual or personal, or even to only affect our families. If we have not yet experienced the emotions of this psalmist, perhaps it is because we are not acquainted or do not have sufficient awareness of the brokenness out there. The brokenness even in our own community, but the brokenness in the world because of sin. And to get acquainted with this brokenness, one only has to study history. That's a good place to start. And I really encourage young people to know your, your history well, to know how you got here, that if you are blessed, yes, Simon, looking around, <laughs> BDI, if you are blessed, it's because others have suffered on your behalf, so that you might be blessed, so that you might be free. Another thing we can do is, is simply read the news. The front page of any newspaper rarely has anything cheerful to say, and that is for a profound reason, because the world is a broken place. Perhaps if you're not that keen on investing the time in history or that keen on investing in depression by reading a newspaper, <laughs> you could at least watch some sombering movies. Um, two that come to mind are Slumdog Millionaire and a movie called Lion, a very, very profound movie. Both of these movies are about uh, slum life in India and, and kind of uh, moving away from that. But the reality is there. You know, there are these places in this world that we cannot imagine, depths of brokenness as a result of sin, which perhaps we would do well to ponder. In the psalmist's case, he was almost certainly in the midst of a corporate tragedy, and he felt deeply for the community of which he was a part. He felt on behalf of others, not just on his own behalf. And this is something God calls his church to. Friends, the, the world is full of the tragedies caused by sin. But what is our response? 
The normal human response is to build our walls to stop them affecting us. Is this an appropriate response to life? To live for security? Perhaps running away from those realities? And perhaps if I could illustrate with a physical example, how do we care for these physical bodies of ours? Do we care for them by wrapping them up in cotton wool and preventing them from meeting the elements? To some extent, yes, but there's a balance, isn't there? Those who are wise know that you need to get out there. You need to put your body through the trial. You need to build endurance, fitness. There's some perhaps extreme examples of this in activities like the Iron Will or the Blue Cross. These, these serious physical events and endurance activities. Why do people go and pursue such things? Why do they pursue essentially what from the outside looks like suffering? Because struggle is an authentic part of life. And it is not something to be avoided at all costs. And if the strongest physically amongst us would go to such lengths to equip their physical bodies, how much more should the truly spiritual equip their souls through the trials that God mercifully brings so that we might turn to him and get that spiritual fitness and be strengthened and see that he is mighty to save, see that mighty arm at work. But you will only see it if you know the reality and the struggle. Friends, we in fact need to allow ourselves to be affected by life's sorrows, both personal and corporate. And when those times come, we must be ready to turn to God. So yes, the psalmist is a great model for us to follow, but not only because of his resolve to seek God and his confidence that God will hear him, but also because he refuses to treat life's tragedies lightly and because he is determined to be real and vulnerable before God. So let's look now in verses 7 and 8 at what the specific situation is in our text and what was his meditation. He uses that word twice at the end of verse 3 and verse 6. And now he shows us, he models a kind of a, a Christian or a Hebrew meditation. And these are his words and his thoughts. Verse 7, Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? It's likely that this psalm is written during the Jewish exile. It is probably written in a foreign country where the people of Israel waited for God to fulfill his promise to them. And during this time of waiting, many more terrifying events took place. The most severe of which is recorded in the book of Esther, when an enemy of the Jews decided that he would destroy every single Jew in the Babylonian Empire, which at that time was every single Jew in the world. And these are just words that we're hearing this morning, but can you imagine the reality faced by those people? Facing the end of your culture, while it looked like it had already ended, you were no longer in your promised home. You were in a foreign land, a very small fish, in a big empire. And what can you do to protect yourself if that empire decides that you are no longer worth keeping around? Surely the writing is on the wall for such as you. And perhaps this is the very situation which the psalmist addresses with these words of anguish in verses 7 through 9. Serious words of feeling and anguish. And it would be a good idea perhaps to reread the psalm and those words with that perspective, some real historical context. What was striking for me as I read these verses was the finality expressed by this writer. Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Is this the end. To ask if God's faithful love had ceased was to ask if he had forgotten his covenant promise. 
That promise that is the thread of the entire Old Testament and is fulfilled in Christ. And we might say, is it right to ask this? Are these, are these meditations really from a believer in Yahweh? Yet what these words reveal is that life is and can be very, very real, very hefty, as Martin shared with us last week. Verse 9 asks, Has God forgotten to be gracious and compassionate? You see, the psalmist almost accuses God of wrong here. But this is the depth of his feeling. And his strongest statement of all, the height of his turmoil, turmoil sorry, comes in verse 10, where he says, I am grieved that the right hand of the Most High has changed. You see, he almost feels like these meditations of his are fulfilled. That God's hand has changed and that God won't save. Now we know, we know from our comfortable position here this morning that this is not possible. We know from the book of Hebrews that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change, and his covenant depends on his faithfulness, which never wavers. So the answer to all those questions that he was asking are, of course, no, 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 no. His love hasn't failed. His compassion hasn't come to an end. But for the man in the moment, what did it feel like? It felt like the answer might be yes, yes, yes. Can we even imagine such anguish? To believe that perhaps God is not for us, but against us. When reading the Psalms, it is important to realize that these are not always necessarily statements of objective truth, but they are statements of the reality of life and what it feels like to be in hard times. This was life for the writer and for his community, his people. And if you're thinking of the exile, remember, that was 70 years of waiting, waiting, waiting for God to act. And yes, I'm sure as I've spoken so far this morning, your mind's gone back to the last couple of years. We are going through some pretty hefty times now. But times weren't much better in Zim before that. We've had tough times. We're still in tough times. How many years has it been? And I'm sorry to say that we don't know what the future holds. Yes, it's been bad. Yes, it's been hard. Young people, I know. Well, I don't know. But you know how hard it has been for you. I, I've really... That's, that's where my thoughts have gone through this whole time. What must it be like to be young at this time? Thanks. <laughs> I'm not still at school there. <laughs> it's a tough time. And I'm sad to say that we don't know what the future holds. And I'm sad to say that it might not be as bad as it could be. And I'm sad to say that it could get worse. What we, what we need is hope. But we need our hope to be in the right place. Not on changed circumstances, but on a God who sees us through and is faithful through those circumstances. And so, while we're reading a lament psalm, and while I'm saying some things that might be hard to hear, the point is not to depress us, but to remind us that when life gets real, the good news is God is there. And hasn't he been there? Hasn't he been so faithful to us through the past two years? And so we come now to the psalmist's response in verse 11. And the thread that ties this psalm together is that of remembrance. And I, I just, I really loved studying this psalm. It, it's, it speaks of remembering what is good and of fixing your mind on God. Ten times the psalmist uses words that talk about our thought life, how we think about things. And Martin shared with us last week, we need to think right. We need to speak God's word back into our own lives. We need to preach to ourselves when we're in the pit about God's faithfulness so that our minds grip onto him. Verse 3, I think of God. I meditate. Verse 5, I consider days of old. At night I remember, I meditate, and my spirit ponders. 
Verse 11, I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions. What a great response. And perhaps we find this surprising. In the midst of his heart turmoil and heart anguish, is it true that the problem is to be addressed and solved by his mind? And the deeply wise answer of God's word is absolutely. In those times of heart anguish, fix your mind on God. In those times of depression, lift your eyes above the reality to where God is. The writer of this psalm is not just content with telling us to do this, but he also models it for us. He demonstrates first in a general way in verses 13 to 15, and then with a very specific meditation. And I'm sure you've realized that Christian meditation is not emptying of the mind, but filling of the mind with truth. And here goes the continuing of his meditation. What does he think about? What does he consider? Verse 13, God, your way is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You revealed your strength among the peoples. With power you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The writer meditates first on the character of God, his greatness and his transcendence, his power and his sovereignty. One of the greatest comforts in the world is knowing that we are tiny, infinitesimally small, and that God is infinitely great. Why? Because if we are small and He is great, then our problems are also small for Him. And He is more than able to deal with them, either to rescue us out of them or even to keep us through them, which is the harder part, but part of this journey which we are on. And then in verses 14 and 15, The psalmist gets more specific. What is it about God that he loves to remember? He loves to remember God's work of salvation. He loves to bring to mind that our God is mighty to save. He remembers redemption. And that's the title of this message today. Take it away with you. Remember redemption. And so the writer of this psalm closes with an even more specific illustration of the type of remembering and meditating he has in mind. As he meditated on the truth that God had redeemed his people, he, his thoughts would have gone back to the Exodus, that period of rescue to which every Israelite turned for an understanding of God's saving work and the assurance that God would save again. And the ultimate act of redemption in that whole experience was the crossing of the Red Sea. And I encourage you to take yourself there if you can, to put yourself in their shoes, to feel the plight of the people caught between the Red Sea and a Pharaoh seeing red. God has guided you, but now it is all over. And isn't that exactly where the psalmist is in his life? So he goes back to the Red Sea. It's the end. There's the chariots. There's the water. It's all over. Death or slavery are all that you can hope for. But then, the waters saw you, God. The waters saw you. They trembled. Even the depths shook. The clouds poured down water. The storm clouds thundered. Your arrows flashed back and forth. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth shook and quaked. Your way went through the sea and your path through the great waters. But your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The history is is one thing to know, but poetry about the event just brings it to life, doesn't it? What a mighty God we serve. He is mighty to save. And so what will our response be the next time life gets real? Which will probably be this coming week, 
Or maybe you are there right now, not knowing where to turn. First, don't feel guilt or shame because your life is not perfect. The prosperity message is a lie. We don't have to be wealthy, positive and happy in order to be assured that God's love and blessing is upon us. That is true no matter the circumstances. Reading the Lament Psalms reminds us that it is okay for life to get real. It is okay. It is in fact normal. And life might get so difficult that we refuse to be comforted, that we despair even of life itself. But that is not where God wants to leave us. That is not where he leaves the psalmist. That is not where he leaves us this morning. His response and our response must not be one of man-centered self-pity. Please hear me on this because we have all been there the past couple of years. Why me, O oh God? <laughs> but his response is ultimately one of God-centered hope. And also, don't beat yourself down because of your emotions. They are a part of you, but take them to God and be real with him. When you are tempted to despair, take your mind and set it on God, his greatness and his acts of redemption. You could put yourselves in the shoes of the Israelites, either in exile, where God rescued them from, or at the Red Sea, and remember how God saved them. But even better, simply remember what God has done to save you, to save us. When life gets real, remember that cross. And if God has dealt with your sin, then he will keep you through and rescue you from every other challenge. So let's do as Paul says and put on the helmet of salvation. That helmet that takes our minds, preserves them, and turns them back to God. And let's remember redemption. And let's remember the cross. God is a God of great and wonderful hope. I'm so pleased that Simon read this morning from the Apostle of Hope, the Apostle Peter. And so I'm going to close with these words from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorruptible, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That is where we are going. 2022 is not your destination. Zambia is not your destination. Heaven is your home. So let's live in light of eternity.